I sat here last night and, and I saw the, uh, the session and the panelists and, and John O'Sullivan with a phenomenal presentation and, and we have more incredible panelists and, and I'm sitting here going, what are you doing here? Um, first of all, I'm from the States, so what do I know compared to, compared to you guys? And I'm sincere when I say that. We hold Canada in such high regard uh, for developing and, and inventing this wonderful game that we love. Um, and, I, and I started to get cold feet, and then it occurred to me, actually, you're probably the exact right person to be here, because if you can do it, certainly these folks can do it. So last night, and I, and I don't mean to disparage anything, it was very theoretical. And it was all true, and it was fantastic. Um, I am going to represent a whole bunch of people back home that just decided on our own we want to do something better. And I am no more qualified than any of you um, to do it. And, and, and I hope your takeaway from that is, if that idiot can do it, I think we can make changes in our club as well. So I want to give you two reasons, two examples of why you, you should consider a player-centered approach. Kirkwood as an association has about 350 kids. We represent less than 10% of Missouri hockey's player population. We started implementing a player-centered approach about seven years ago. And three years ago, there was a study conducted of the AAA players coming out of Missouri and where they originated. And just like Alberta, we're a districted area. So where you live mandates where you, where you start your career. And although we're less than 10% of the playing population in our state, we are over 20% of the, of, the, of the players playing AAA. So we way over index in the amount of kids we develop at the very elite level. What bothers me though is that tends to be where the conversation always goes. Um, and, and I'll give you the second reason why you should do it is because it's good for everybody else as well. And there's an, there's an example that comes to mind for me that hits home uh, because it was my nephew. And when we first went to a cross ice game, there were some kids who had played full ice the previous season that fell into the classification to move to a cross ice format. And granted, for a lot of parents, that caused a lot of anxiety because that doesn't sound like progress. So are you telling me what we were doing before was wrong? Yes, and I'm sorry. My nephew, by the time he was nine, had quit four sports already. And John was telling us last night that, that kids stop playing, 70% of our kids stop playing by the time they're 13. Well, he, he was falling into that classification and there was nothing left but hockey and my sister had begged him to play for one more year. I get, I get kind of emotional about that one every time. It's unbelievable. So this, this, this kid, who knows he's no good, decides to stick it out for one more season and he moves into a cross-ice format and he's two games into it and just like every kid out there, he scores about five goals in the game. And I went up to him after the game and I said, Cooper, I heard you scored four goals today. And he looks up at me and he goes, I know, I don't know how I got so good. <laughs> he is a sophomore in high school. He's still a bad hockey player. And he still loves the game because we, we made him, excuse me, we made him as good as we, we could make him, and it was all about his skills and his development, and in the end, that's what all of our kids care about. He will be a lifelong hockey fan, he will be a Blues season ticket holder, he will play senior men's, and, and he will be exactly why we need to do what we're talking about doing this weekend, because it's the best for every level of player that's out there. So how did I get here? 
I'm just a guy who, who uh, was thankfully blessed with parents who, who gave me an open mind. And the first time I heard about half ice hockey and cross ice, I said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How are they going to learn positions? They don't even know what offsides is. This is stupid. Um, but I did some research, and I, and I realized the benefits. And, and thankfully, there's a ton out there. The age of information, everything's at our disposal for willing to go look for it. And I realized I was wrong, or I thought I was wrong. So I got together with a group of people, and we talked about implementing a program, and we just did it. And I hate to steal Nike's billion dollar tagline, but that's, that's what really I think the administration here is asking you this weekend is to just decide to do it. And you're going to make mistakes, but I, I promise you, you are going to be better off than what you were doing before. So I want to explain to you briefly what a model association means in the United States. It means a full adoption of the American Development Model principles through 12U or PeeWee. Um, it means age-appropriate training, including a commitment to off-ice and nutrition. It is a almost singular focus on skill development. And there were some good questions last night about this player-centric model, aren't we in a team game? Well, what, what they ask us to do is teach the team game differently and break it down into individual components so we don't have five kids working a breakout and ten kids on their knees. We break the breakout down into individual skill elements and we work on those simultaneously so that all the kids are moving and, and eventually they put it together themselves in a game. We restrict travel and our season duration one thing that I, that I so appreciate from USA Hockey is they're the only national governing body that's telling their kids to put their stuff away. Go play other sports. And, and, and we do that as well. We have a defined game and roster size. In other words, the littlest kids, we, we call them mini-mites at 6U. I, I'm not sure the terminology up here. 8U we call mites. I think that's your novice. Those kids play cross ice at 6U, half ice at 4U, or excuse me, at 8U, and they don't start playing full ice until they're squirts. If I had my way, it wouldn't start until peewees. We also um, have, have minimum roster sizes. We have squirt parents. We only have 10 kids on a roster if we can help it. We're not going to turn anybody away, but if the numbers work out, we try and keep it at 10. And we have parents saying, we're losing the game in the third period because our kids are gassed. And I said, are you, are you complaining about too much ice time? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Because I don't care if your kid loses the game today, and neither should you. So we have to constantly refocus their, their energies on what it is we're trying to measure. And we have a commitment to review and modify and educate. And, and that, is, that was also a theme that was brought up last night. Communication on a regular basis. Why do we care about being a model association? Well, they, they dangled the carrot in front of, of clubs around the country and said, hey, if, if you can live up to these things that we mandate, we'll, we'll pay you for it. OK. We'll take money. Um, and they have the resources like, like the folks here, and believe me, we don't have nearly enough, but they have the resources to come in and talk to us, help us through our challenges, um, and, and, and we get a significant um, number of visits from some really smart people who, uh, who help us improve. It gives us a marketing advantage. Uh, we, we are using the model association designation the same way a restaurant might say that they're, they're an A-level restaurant. You feel safe. I don't know what that means as a parent. I'm new to this game. But somehow you've been endorsed by USA Hockey, so this must be the place that's good for my kid. 
it provides us a clarity of, po of purpose um, when we start getting in discussions about what it is that we're doing. And it's very easy to get sidetracked by a vocal minority or a, a singular idea. We're able to refocus and say, we're a model association. And, and so it's got to be about the player. And, and someone asked for this last night, and, and I don't like to ever use this card, but um, we blame it on the boss. We, we're not doing it because they say we're not doing it. Now, I happen to believe that, and I'll tell you why it's a good reason, but in the end, we're not going to risk our model association status so that your child can play up a division where he doesn't belong. So when all else fails, it's no because mom said so. I want you to take away three things from me today. And the first is to lead passionately. If it's not you and it's someone else in your association, find that person who you believe has the energy to really tackle this. Because the worst thing you can do for your children is to, to go into this half-hearted. I guess 90% of the kids that come to play hockey for me um, are first-generation hockey players. I suspect that number flips here, and 90% are eighth-generation hockey players with some really steeped tradition and knowledge in their family. So yes, your resistance is going to be harder than mine. You've got to have the resolve to just fight through it. Because if you don't, they're going to overwhelm you. You say, ah, that didn't work. And it's another 20 years before those kids in your community get, get the opportunity to play this game the right way. And I don't mean that as, as a disparaging comment about, about the way that you do things. I just mean reintroducing the fun and, and giving this game back to the way that, frankly, we all played growing up. So please. Find that person who's willing to be the first one through the door in your association. Because it's not, it's not that difficult. You just got to wear them out. You just outweigh them. I want you to, to communicate frequently. We have two forms of communication at our association. Those from the, the president or me as the coaching director. But let's be honest, the real communication comes from that individual coach. It's nice to hear from on high what's going on, but those parents look to their individual coach. Those dozen families are saying, what is it, what is it, what do you believe? Because you're the one who works with my child or children day to day, and I really care what you think. So we, we encourage and provide our coaches with the information to communicate frequently. And lastly, adjust regularly. Um, I'm going to, to show you some mistakes that we made. Um, and, and we adjusted as quickly as we could. So there is an air, there is a spirit of experimentation in our association um, that wasn't there before, but it's there now. And seven years into this, no one thinks anything of it. And I know that's, that's unique, but you can get there. Um, I happen to be from a club now that is all about change. And that scares a lot of people. And we weren't that way when we started. Um, so I grew up playing for Kirkwood. Went away, went to school, coached at various levels. Like most people, when you first get out of school and you want to get into coaching, you dream of coaching. Um, at the elite levels. I want to be the next Scotty Bowman. So I'm going to coach high school. And then I realized those kids didn't want to listen to me. So I'll coach Bantams. Well, those kids don't want to listen either. And I kept moving down and I went, maybe it's not that they didn't want to listen. Maybe it's that I wasn't where I belong. And when I had my own children and started getting back into coaching at the very youngest ages, I realize, quite honestly, my niche personally is 10, 10 year and under. But I was shocked when, when I went back to my association and, and my oldest son, who is now a freshman, 
was a uh, five-year-old starting out, and I couldn't believe how much we sucked. And I didn't remember sucking growing up. I was on a team that experienced some success, and as a kid, all you can focus on is yourself. And my team playing was always very competitive. So to be honest with you, I don't know if my association sucked at the time, because it, my teams didn't. But I couldn't believe how much tarnish there was on the star of the Kirkwood Stars. So we had about a 350 winning percentage. And what is that, about a 270 minus goal differential? No wonder parents were unhappy. So admittedly, I was in an association that was ready for change. We were actually just talking about that. There's a tipping point. If you're experiencing some success, it's going to be harder to do the right thing. Because why, why mess with something that's working? Well, I can assure you that it can work a lot better. So I went, I actually wasn't even the instigator. Uh, a couple of people in that video that we saw, a couple of people were the crazy ones dancing by themselves. And they brought me, and I guess I, they were the flint and I was the spark. And they said, you, you're the one who's dumb enough to take this to the board. Here's the information. Go do it. And I did. So we went to the board, and we, we, we gave them a proposal. And it basically said, our kids are not having any fun. And we need to re-engage in the fun. That picture you saw of me, he is known around Kirkwood as Hip Hop Santa. And he shows up at the rink if there's been a particularly bad snowstorm the night before. And you have 7 AM practice. Hip Hop Santa comes out at practice and tries to thank you for, for trudging through the snow and getting up early. And the kids go crazy. And we, we run around, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with whoever said it last night, fun is not a bad word. Fun is a sneaky way to make your kids sweat and work hard. We said we want to have intramural cross-ice games because we know we can't convince any other association to do this. So let's just bring it in-house. We combined our 6U and our most remedial 8U kids so that we'd have enough to have an in-house league. And I know some of you are in associations that you say, if we played in-house, that's nine or 10 kids. Well, I'm here this morning because I want to share what I believe is really right. And we share it with our neighbor associations. We share it with the state. We share it with USA Hockey. We'll share it with anyone who asks, and, and even strangers on the bus, because I got 10 minutes to kill, and I'm really excited. My point is, when you get to this commitment, it doesn't matter the jersey anymore or the town that they're from. Do what's right for the kids, even if that means that the team that you hate, you now have to play with. We are in discussions with merging with my arch rival growing up. And it is, it is, it is it initially it was killing me to even consider that idea. But there are so many benefits for our association if we get to that size. We can have professional staffing. I, I don't want to go there. But my point is, it's not about me anymore. It's, it, it is truly about the, the kids that are playing. So borders and rivalries be damned. If you need to, to hook up with another association to have an in-house league, do so. We went to station-based practices. Um, which is probably something I don't really have to educate you about, but it was radical for, for our area seven or eight years ago when we lost a bunch of coaches. Not a bunch, but we lost some coaches over it. And we went to 100% commitment to skill development. 100% focus on skills with the theory that, as I said in the video, if we can make a better hockey player, then we can worry about records down the road. And the beauty of 